Hello and welcome to a special episode of Asia in Depth. I'm Matt Schiavenza. On January 3rd, Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani was killed at the Baghdad International Airport by a U.S. drone strike. The attack sent shockwaves throughout the region and has triggered the first major international crisis of the new year. Soleimani was arguably his country's second most powerful official. He orchestrated Iranian influence in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere in the Middle East. And his death has sparked fear that the always tense Iran-U.S. relationship could spiral into war. Following an Iranian attack on two U.S. bases in Iraq on January 8th, which caused damage but no casualties, President Trump declared that Washington would not escalate further. There were signs Iran might stand down as well. But it's not at all clear that the crisis between the two countries has ended. In this episode, we bring you insight into the situation in Iran from Puneet Talwar. A former special advisor to President Obama, he was also senior director at the National Security Council for the Gulf States, Iran, and Iraq, as well as the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs. This podcast episode is adapted from an Asia Society phone briefing recorded last Friday. It includes extended analysis from Talwar, as well as a brief Q&A with Asia Society Executive Vice President Tom Nagorski. Uh, welcome to this Asia Society conversation, Panita. It's great to have you with us. And perhaps uh, you might start just by assessing uh, where things stand uh, and perhaps offering some thoughts on the way forward, um, not just for Iran and the United States, but maybe for the region as well. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with uh, with all of you. Um, I thought I'd uh, address three um, main issues in, in the, the, the opening portion that we can go further into uh, during the Q&A session. But uh, uh, first of all, you know, is the crisis over? Second, uh, how has the crisis uh, impacted the internal situation in Iran? Uh, and then third, um, what, we, we, what we should expect to see from Iran, both on the nuclear program and in terms of its regional posture. So on the first issue um, about the crisis, I think while the immediate danger has passed, unfortunately, I think the risk of conflict persists. Uh, Iran's uh, strikes uh, in retaliation were designed primarily for their own public and for regional audiences. They were also shot across the bow and aimed at showcasing some of their precision strike capabilities um, in the event that there are more serious hostilities. Um, but if you believe uh, Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompeo um, that there was intelligence suggesting that Iran deliberately tried to kill Americans, then uh, we really got very lucky and dodged a bullet here because um, American casualties, in my opinion, would have triggered a uh, military response that would quickly have led to an escalatory cycle. Um, Iran's uh, supreme leader has called the strikes a slap in the face, but he's also said that uh, revenge awaits. And that's where I think one of the primary dangers uh, lies, actually. Iran's uh, most likely means to exact revenge will be to use covert actions that are difficult to trace. Uh, that's what we've grown accustomed to. Uh, and so while this overt phase of Iran's response may be over, the clandestine phase may just be beginning. Um, they may seek to target uh, American officials. Um, uh, they may step up attacks against the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're likely to use proxies, uh, and we've seen that they've demonstrated an, an ability to have an operational reach which really spans the globe. Um, their goal uh, will be to humiliate the U.S. Uh, in extension, and by extension the president. Um, at the same time, they don't want war, and I want to be very clear about that. Um, so they're likely to opt for actions that cannot be attributable uh, and traced back to Iran. Um, one example of where they tried to do this is, is in 2011, where I actually ended up spending about three weeks in the White House Situation Room um, helping to coordinate uh, our government's response uh, across a number of agencies as we disrupted a sophisticated plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington. Uh, and I could point to a number of other examples of such operations, uh, either by Iran or its proxies. Um, I don't believe that the Soleimani strike has had a strategic deterrent effect. It may have caused Iran to pause temporarily um, and to have greater respect for American intelligence capabilities, but it's more likely to result in a change in operational security and tactics, not an overall strategic direction. 
So the second uh, question, what is happening in Iran and what's the impact of recent events on Iranian politics? Um, I think Soleimani's death has hit the regime hard. It's a blow personally to the supreme leader. Uh, Soleimani was a charismatic figure, and he was carrying out a policy central to the self-identity of the Islamic Republic, and namely that sustaining Iran's leadership, what Iran calls the axis of resistance, and what we in the United States call Iran's network of proxy groups uh, throughout the region. But we need to understand that at the end of the day, Soleimani was a highly effective implementer of a strategy. He was not the sole person setting that strategy. Iran has deep institutions, and Soleimani's loss, in my opinion, doesn't really affect the operational capability of the Quds Force. Uh, in fact, I think General Ghani, the uh, successor, uh, will likely feel a need to demonstrate his bona fides early on in his tenure. Overall, I expect uh, the Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, to enhance their already dominant position within the regime. Um, I think the Supreme Leader has always been loath to appear weak. He's going to want to reassure regime stalwarts both at home and uh, Iran's allies in the axis of resistance abroad that the regime is still powerful, capable, and can be relied upon. Uh, and he, I think he's going to view the killing of Soleimani as an affirmation of his view that the United States is really after uh, regime change. He's believed that all the way through, even during the Obama administration. I don't think he ever abandoned that uh, uh, that perception. Uh, and he thinks the Islamic Republic is in this long struggle with the United States in the region, and he thinks Iran will prevail in that over time uh, because he believes the U.S. will grow wary and eventually leave the region. And um, I think some of the statements that we've heard um, about uh, desire to leave the region, especially from the president in recent years, um, and, and this is a general perception of war wariness over time in the U.S. has sort of fed that, uh, that belief on his end. Um, I think that Rouhani and uh, Zarif, um, who are generally considered the more moderate figures um, in the reg regime, uh, are considerably weakened um, uh, by this action. Uh, uh, they were already weakened, I believe, by the withdrawal from the, the JCPOA, and I think so we're going to see probably a further diminishment in their influence. Uh, now, to be sure, there are real tensions internally. Um, we've heard it from regime figures. Uh, uh, Rouhani and Zarif have, have resented uh, the power and influence of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, they have told us repeatedly that they see sanctions and withdrawal from the JCPOA as really hurting them and strengthening the hand of the Revolutionary Guard. And you'll remember that last spring, Zarif actually submitted his resignation after he was excluded from a meeting in Tehran between Bashar al-Assad uh, and Khamenei. And tellingly, Soleimani was actually in that meeting. So it's also worth remembering that all of this is taking place against the backdrop of a few uh, important political events that are upcoming. We've got parliamentary elections next month, and I expect hardliners will prevail in that. Uh, we've got presidential elections in a little bit over a year, uh, late next spring. Rouhani won't be running because he's term limited. And finally, and most importantly, we should expect to see a transition uh, in the supreme leader um, uh, position itself, in, at some point in the next few years, given Ayatollah Khamenei's advanced age and his uh, health. So third and, and, and last, and then we'll go to questions, I want to just quickly address uh, what we should expect to see from Iran in the region uh, and on the nuclear program as well. Um, and uh, I think, you know, let's assume for a moment that Iran chooses not to continue its retaliation through covert means, as I asserted up front and then we just simply return to uh, the status quo ante. I, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, so happy about that situation. It's not as if we were in a particularly stable situation previously. Um, I think Iran's strategic goal has been to see the departure of U.S. forces from the region, uh, and I think it's likely to use Soleimani's killing to increase the pressure on Iraq to achieve that aim. And this morning you will have seen some of the back and forth where uh, the acting prime minister in Iraq, Adil Abdel Mahdi, asked the U.S. to send a team to discuss an orderly uh, withdrawal and the mechanisms for a withdrawal. And Secretary Pompeo said that any discussion would be on the appropriate force posture of, uh, of U.S. Uh, troops in the region. So there's, uh, there's still to be um, uh, more to be discussed on that topic. 
I think the Gulf states and Israel will be deeply concerned if U.S. troops do leave Iraq. Um, Afghanistan will also be concerned uh, about that and, and, and two other things. Uh, they don't want to become the next theater for a U.S.-Iran conflict, and they also fear uh, an abrupt U.S. departure from, uh, from Afghanistan, of course. Um, I do want to say that Iran is facing a number of challenges um, uh, uh, on the domestic front. Uh, chief among them is uh, the, the desperate need it has for sanctions relief. Uh, I think the IMF estimate was that the Iranian economy was uh, supposed to shrink by 9% or more um, last year. Uh, we'll see what the final numbers come in, and I suspect this will be a very difficult year as well. And Iran is going to look for points of leverage to try and convince Europe to relieve sanctions pressure. The nuclear program, I think, provides some leverage. Iran has now said that it is bound, is no longer bound by the limitation on the, on, on the enrichment of uranium under the uh, uh, Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, however, I think it's maintaining uh, important cooperation with the IAEA and not fully stepping back from its obligations. I don't expect to see a nuclear breakout um, that's something that was almost certainly invite uh, an American uh, military response, um, and it would also uh, meet with incredible opposition from uh, not just Europe but also uh, China and Russia. Um, instead, I suspect that we'll continue to see a gradual ratchet, ratcheting up of activities uh, to put pressure on Europe and provide leverage uh, should talks uh, ever resume um, uh, with the United States most likely after the next uh, presidential election. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think that Saudi, the UAE, and oil trade are the potential weak links in the chain from Iran's perspective. Um, they're likely to be in the crosshairs uh, of any uh, potential responses uh, uh, from Iran. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in terms of negotiations, I don't see direct U.S.-Iran talks as possible right now. I think the Supreme Leader would view them as a capitulation under these circumstances. Uh, this is not North Korea, as the Iranians regularly remind us. Uh, they don't see sitting down with the U.S. as a prize. In fact, it's uh, precisely the opposite. Um, but that leaves them with a dilemma. How does Iran get the sanctions relief that it really needs? Um, and so I do see some room for continued third-party activity. Uh, President Macron has been quite active in this space, and I expect that we'll continue to see his efforts. Uh, Shinzo Abe has also uh, tried to play a role, and Imran Khan even uh, uh, tried to, uh, to offer to help. Um, I think the Macron effort is the one that's most likely to gain traction because it already has uh, managed to, to uh, uh, interest uh, President Trump. Uh, in the event of hostilities, though, I could actually see President uh, Putin stepping in and trying to play a role to, to diffuse tensions and enhance uh, Russia's role in the region. So I could go on, but why don't I stop there and uh, we, can, uh, we can get into questions. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Puni Talwar. That's a great, uh, great sweep you've given us in a very short time. Uh, maybe I can just start with, a, with some follow-ups. And, and, and the first, I, I, I would like to just drill a little further on the point you made at the outset about the Iranian strike the other day and the comments that Secretary Pompeo and Vice President Pence had made suggesting that uh, that they had, uh, the Iranians had aimed to uh, uh, to cause uh, uh, significant casualties among uh, the American forces in Iraq. The, uh, a counterpoint has been made uh, by many others that the Iranians likely knew very well uh, where the force contingent was. Uh, and could have done much more damage, and even that they they signaled, uh, you know, precisely that they were trying to do the opposite. What do you make of that? Um, uh, is that a kind of unknowable? Uh, do you have any thoughts one way or the other? Um, I, I, you know, it's hard to get inside their heads. I, my sense is that had they wanted to really go after personnel, they could have, and the strike could have been larger. It could have extended outside of. Uh, of Iraq, but I think they wanted to send a, a particular signal by saying, um, you know, we know where these strikes came from. We want to respond in the same theater uh, where you attacked um, uh, General Soleimani. And if you look at some of the satellite imagery of the um, uh, of the destruction from the uh, ballistic missile attacks, they're they're relatively precise. And I think Iran, as I said, was trying to show that capability off. So I don't think my sense is that they were not trying to deliberately 
uh, inflict you know maximum uh, casualties. Um, there's a strong argument to be made that they were trying to avoid that as much as possible, but I don't think they were trying to avoid them altogether. I think they very well knew that they might well um, uh, uh, kill or injure uh, some Americans, and they seemed to be prepared uh, for that. Thank you. And, and I, I, at the risk of once again asking you to, as you just said, get into the heads of the Iranian policymakers, but this is a broader point, uh, uh, to your your assessment that it isn't over, uh, at least you know maybe the overt phase is. It, it interesting phrasing, but we've heard it a couple of times uh, in a couple of settings in the last few days from the Iranians, including uh, via its ambassador at the United Nations here in New York, who spoke to uh, NPR the other day, uh, that it had after the strike quote uh, concluded proportionate measures unquote. Um, do you what do you make of that statement? Again, those words were used a few times in in light of your your broader uh, view that um, at least the covert activity uh, uh, is not over, not concluded, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I saw those those comments um, and the other and uh, and uh, Javad Zarif's uh, tweet shortly thereafter as basically an attempt at uh, escalation uh, control. Um, they did not want this to spiral into anything else. Uh, they were not looking for, um, certainly wanted to avoid any American uh, responses uh, on their territory proper. And I think it's also interesting that um, uh, we haven't seen the text of the letter, but there was apparently a letter that was sent by the administration shortly after um, the um, uh, after the uh, the strike on, on Soleimani. Uh, Part of it was, I think, uh, summarily dismissed as an offer for, for dialogue, and, I, and uh, uh, that was shot down. But it was interesting how uh, some of the, um, uh, the more hardline elements of the regime uh, read out parts of that letter. Uh, the, you know, they said something to the effect of uh, the Americans have said that, uh, you know, we should not uh, respond disproportionately, but that's not for them to decide. So, in other words, they felt that they had space to, you know, respond to something that was relatively proportionate. So I think they were trying to keep this, and I think, if I believe, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Zarif's tweet also referred to the U.N. Charter uh, and the right of, of self-defense. And so they were trying to, in a sense, uh, keep the overt part of this within, you know, somewhat acceptable norms of, uh, of, of state behavior in this kind of a circumstance. Um, of course, uh, Clandestine activity is entirely different. Uh, uh, it's deniable, uh, and uh, so I, I don't think that those statements should be seen as applying to uh, uh, to whatever they may do in that realm. Got it. Uh, so l let's come to Washington, uh, maybe for a moment, Puneet. We've asked you to uh, get into the heads of the Iranians. I, it may be only slightly easier to get into the heads of the Americans here, but. <laughs> Uh, back to the, the the strike and the killing of General Soleimani himself. Um, do you believe? Uh, I mean, one would imagine that the prospect that at some point uh, he, he was. Uh, we now have heard uh, a great deal about how he, he traveled openly. Um, the, the prospect for such a moment must, at least to some, at high levels, uh, not have been a surprise. Uh, maybe it was to the president, but do you think there was a strategic aim to uh, uh, to find him and go after him, or do you think this was just an opportunity that presented itself? And I guess that goes to the larger question of whether there is a strategy here vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Iran in the next steps. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I can only know what I read, and that is that uh, you've had uh, – you know, some of the administration, in particular uh, Secretary Pompeo, pushing for this for some time. Um, and I think that to the extent that there was a strategy around this, I think it was to send a signal um, that, uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, Secretary Esper said recently, that the, the rules of the game have changed um, and uh, that there can be no longer impunity for uh, these types of activities. Uh, but to to put it very uh, bluntly, no, I don't 
believe there was a uh, there is a broader strategy around this uh in terms of the second third and fourth order consequences uh where it might leave the United States um in the region uh how it feeds into a larger diplomatic strategy to uh to deal both with uh, uh you know the twin threats as the United States sees them the Iranian nuclear program as well as Iran's destabilizing activities in the region um it uh it it doesn't make sense in in either respect so you've half answered uh, my next question uh Puneet which goes to uh from again the US perspective uh what's been gained i mean one of the things uh even though a week is not that long a time we have had the benefit of an awful lot of uh i think very respected and smart analysis from all sides uh both in the aftermath of of uh the killing of general Soleimani and then also uh in the couple of days since the retaliation um and on you know and so we've heard plenty of people say this is a disaster for security and for US interests in the region and others saying it has uh left a, a greatly improved situation uh wh- where do you come down and i realize that's probably a moving target too uh but uh, what's your assessment so um I look at our, our 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 broader aim. So I, I think the, you know, one question is, um, you know, just looking at it narrowly, um, you know, will this have any kind of an impact on uh, uh, the kinds of activities that that Soleimani and the Quds Force were engaged in uh, across the region? Will it uh, set back uh, Iran's uh, uh, capabilities and what it's doing across the region? And, and there, I honestly. Uh, don't see a, a, a strategic impact. Again, perhaps at a tactical level, perhaps in terms of a, of a change in, in, in operational security, uh, they may be a little more careful. It may cause uh, some people in the chain to say, okay, if, if I follow through with, uh, um, uh, with what I'm being ordered to do, will I be, uh, you know, uh, in the crosshairs? Uh, but I don't think that's a, that really impacts things at a strategic level. Um, I think what we're seeing playing out in Iraq um, uh, right now in terms of uh, American troops, uh, if that actually ends up leading uh, in an American withdrawal, that will be a net uh, setback uh, in terms of the U.S.-Iran confrontation, but also I would say in terms of uh, the counter-ISIS uh, campaign, uh, which uh, has been put on pause uh, because of this recent crisis. So, um, you know, that campaign was already uh, – uh, somewhat set back uh, by the uh, precipitous announcement uh, or the announcement of a precipitous drawdown, which was then subsequently partially reversed in Syria. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think a lot of our, our allies and partners in that region are quite concerned. Um, Israel, uh, the Gulf states, uh, they're keeping their heads down right now. Uh, Israel in particular is is worried about, uh, you know, what Hezbollah may do uh, in the future. Um, uh, they're also worried about uh, 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 past instances of repeating themselves of uh, Iran's uh, retaliation against soft targets, uh, Jewish targets, for example, uh, across, the, uh, across many parts of the world. Uh, Saudi and the UAE are worried that we may have hit the uh, hornet's nest uh, and uh, may not be prepared to uh, to then, uh, you know, stand by them if they're the, they're in the crosshairs. And, and I think Iran does view those two countries as, uh, uh, as quite vulnerable, um, especially, uh, because it didn't see much of a re- response to, uh, the, uh, attack on the upcake oil facility, the moves against the tankers, uh, the, uh, the shooting down of the American drone. That may have actually encouraged a little bit of boldness. And I think part of what you saw in this, going back to your previous question, uh, to the extent that there was a strategic element to this, uh, it may have been to try to reestablish some of the, uh, the deterrence that was lost, um, you know, by the non-responses earlier. Um, so I, I think when you net it all out, I see a um, uh, somewhat of a deterioration for the United States strategic position. Thank you. And, and, and my only other question involves something you alluded to in a kind of tantalizing way, which you, you called third-party activity, potential opportunities, despite how rough the patches we're in right now between the U.S. and Iran. 
and I think among others, you, you mentioned Shinzo Abe, who, of course, had a meeting with Rouhani not long ago, uh, Imran Khan, Emmanuel Macron, and even, even Vladimir Putin, perhaps. Um, can you game out a little bit more, uh, you know, the mechanics and, and uh, how much hope one realistically uh, might put at the moment in, in terms of any of that, uh, uh, again, what you call third-party activity to just kind of getting us out of the, the morass of the U.S.-Iran uh, relationship at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, there, there's still, I still think there's a chance, and maybe I'm, uh, um, you know, overly optimistic. But that's, you know, the, that's been the nature of my business for a long time. You have to, it's, to look it's for the nature the of the Asia Society too. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, it, it's uh, look. I see, I see a couple of interests overlapping still. Um, you know, I, I don't think, um, I think President Trump would would like a win. Um, uh, I don't think he wants to have uh, conflict with Iran in an election year. I also think that uh, the Iranians really are uh, are desperate, as I said, for sanctions relief, uh, and it does not have to be uh, in their minds, uh, you know, a complete uh, restoration of the nuclear deal. They will accept something temporary, uh, some sort of a freeze uh, that allows them to to get access to some funds. Um, uh, in exchange for, you know, partial compliance. Um, so I see those overlapping interests. Uh, and I think President Macron has figured out um, that uh, a lot of this really has to be done uh, when you're dealing with the Trump administration, um, that uh, the decision-making is made at the top. Uh, and so he is, he is he has been carrying this out. We saw this in uh, in the, the G7 summit and uh, during the General Assembly, you know, directly, directly with President Trump, you know, walking over to um, uh, President Rouhani's suite um, and, uh, you know, demanding to see him. Um, and, uh, you know, we may have some, some upcoming opportunities. Um, I uh, would expect uh, uh, that we'll probably see, um, uh, you know, I don't know if, if – uh, I think President Trump is planning to go to Davos. I don't know if uh, Zarif and Macron will be there. Uh, that would be one such opportunity. Uh, Munich Security Conference is upcoming. So there are any number of, of, of places one could imagine that a discussion might get going. Um, uh, President Macron spoke for an hour the other day with President Rouhani, so I suspect he hasn't uh, given this up. And I think that the Europeans in particular who were really – uh, unhappy with the U.S. withdrawal from the joint uh, from the JCPOA, we'll see um, uh, you know some sort of a uh, a move along those lines, uh, not necessarily to restore it fully, but to have uh, a freeze in activity, um, uh, no further sanctions, maybe some partial access to funds uh, in return for uh, Iran coming back into partial compliance at least. Uh, they will. They see that as the key, I think, to ratcheting down, ratcheting down not just nuclear tensions, but also the broader tensions um, in the region. Thank you for listening to this special edition of Asia in Depth. To learn more, you can check out our show page at asiasociety.org/podcast and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Asia Society. Later this week, we'll bring you a regularly scheduled episode featuring Korean-American actor Daniel Day Kim in conversation with Hollywood producer and Asia Society Southern California senior advisor Janet Yang. I'm Matt Skiavenza. See you next time.